Super Bowl Sunday. <gasps> Super Bowl Sunday, baby. What can be more exciting than that? Well, let me tell you what can be more exciting than that. It's what your pastor tells you every week. What's more exciting than Super Bowl Sunday is the kingdom of God and you're on Team Jesus, the winning team. <laughs>Good morning, First Baptist. Pastor Dave here. Great to be with you on Sunday, February 7, 2021. It's Super Bowl Sunday. Do you have a dog in the fight? Are you going, go Chiefs, go. Braves looking at you. Are you going Bucks, Bucks, Bucks? San Mateo's own Tom Brady, who should be playing for the Niners. We should have signed him. I digress. Don't even get me started. It was a lot more cheerful for lots of reasons this time last year, but especially on Super Bowl Sunday. Hopefully the Niners will be back. Before I pray and start, just a few announcements. Again, we're so glad that you're here with us. I'm gonna rattle through these announcements quickly. I'm not very good at them. I just wanna get them over, so bear with me. First, for those that have been giving coats the last two weeks, thank you. We have plenty of coats. They've pivoted at Street Life down in Redwood City. They need jeans. So if you have used jeans, lightly used jeans that you wanna get rid of, We'll take those and we'll get those to the right people. One thing is still going. One dash thing that dash one dash thing dot org. Uh, socks, socks, socks. Those people who are um, sleeping in tents or on the street, they've got their coats. We're going to get them their jeans, but they always need socks. Foot hygiene is a is at a premium for those who need it. So please visit uh, and donate socks if you can. Our virtual food drive is still going on. Second Harvest Food Bank, go ahead and log on to shfb.org. There's a donate or help. You can click that and it goes to a virtual food drive. If you just put First Baptist Church in the memo when you give, uh, again, you've been so generous, but there's just so many needs. We can keep track there. Parents, you probably received an email this week from Miss Lorraine. We're reintroducing our Gospel Project curriculum. Lots of reasons our kids need it. We're mindful of all the time they're spending on screens, but all the resources are there for you for our weekly curriculum as we look forward to reopening at some point. We're going to try and keep that train going. So there's videos, there's worksheets, there's discussions, and you can go about that on your own pace. You can print things out and have your child watch the curriculum when it's ready for them. Maybe during service, as I prepare, and I've prepared a sermon. Yeah, I don't know if too many kids watch the sermon. That's okay. I get it. My kids sometimes are dad, but there's resources for you that are parents. If you're not on that list, go ahead for any reason, parents or any reason you want to get on our email list, go ahead and email info at fbcsancarlos.org. Info at fbcsancarlos.org. We'll get you on our weekly email list. And if you are a parent, say, Get me on that curriculum list. I don't think we missed anybody, but we're always looking to get the information out there. We are looking to reopen safely and sanely. I know there's been court rulings and, and people talking, even to me and to others. We're praying. We're going slow. We're doing that for our own benefit as a body, but also our neighbors. Uh, spring is coming. It will warm up. Meeting outside is a possibility, but we're working really hard to get our body back together in a safe and sane way. So keep praying uh, with us over that. And finally, new members and baptism. We have had people who want to join the church. We want to honor that. So if you're interested in membership, reach out to us via email, via, via text, via call. And if you want to be baptized, if you want to heed the commandment of our Lord, when we believe, when we have been given faith and receive that, He's told us to be baptized. We'd love to talk to you about that, what that means, what that doesn't mean. There's some... Uh, sometimes some misnomers, but we want to do that again safely and sanely, even in the midst of this COVID season. Oh, lots of announcements. That's good. Lots of good things going on. Let me pray, and we have a wonderful service for you. And maybe in the comments after I pray, you can say, Go Bucks or Go Chiefs. Let's pray. Father, you're good. Even in the midst of turmoil and a dark time, in our world's history, in our nation's history, reeling with a pandemic. Meet us today. Impress upon our hearts from young to old the great truth of your love in the person of your son, Jesus. Jesus, come have your way in our hearts. 
Give us the grace we need to concentrate just for an hour or so. And then Holy Spirit, empower us to come before you daily and say, how great thou art. Thank you for today. Thank you for the music. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for the ministry you're still doing here on the corner of Olive and Walnut. Bless us and keep us now in Christ's name. Amen. Enjoy the service, FBC. I'll see you again soon.
grace draw near and bless your name.
my father grew up in Hilo, Hawaii. And um, so as I grew up, we would go out and visit my, my relatives out there. We'd visit my grandmother and grandfather. And uh, when we were there on a Sunday, we would go to church with them. And at their church there in Hilo, um, they would sing the doxology every Sunday in their service. Uh, but they would sing it in Hawaiian. And I thought it was really cool. Um, so I learned it, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. So I'll sing it first in Hawaiian, and then we'll sing it together in English. And uh, if you know it in Hawaiian, sing along, all right? Ho'onani kamakua Keki me kauhane no Ke aku a mau o o mai ka ipu Ko ke yao, ko ke la God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
All right, FBC, thank you so much for the uh, worship music. Uh, Dave Matsumura, Pastor Jerome, Pastor Esteban, and a couple older archive versions. It's so great to worship. And uh, we're going to jump into our new series. Uh, you probably saw the little intro there. You might have heard the guitar and that beautiful video with all the pictures of the vastness of our universe and our planet. And we're going to be uh, really settling in on how great thou art. And uh, what a, a dear hymn that's, that's been to many of us song as I've studied it this week. An amazing history, and I'll get into that. And then we'll see the scriptural parallels where um, God does something amazing with music. He's gifted people to lead. Uh, he's gifted people to sing. But I would argue he's intertwined most, if not all of our hearts, to resonate with music. And we can memorize music, at least I can, sometimes more easily than scripture. And what I'm going to get into in our sermon today is how that song can really impact our heart, both personally, but as we go out and share the good news of Jesus to a world who desperately uh, needs to hear it. Uh, before I start, we do have some sad news this week. Um, two of our dear friends in the Lord went to be home uh, in the past 10 days. Pat Eulich, beloved member here uh, at FBC, served and loved and um, really was just a joy to be uh, living with, ministering with, uh, doing life with, I'll say it that way. She passed away in her sleep on Friday, January 29th. Please be praying for her family, especially her granddaughter, Ashley Anderson, in this difficult time. And we're trying to surround them as best we can uh, in the midst of a pandemic. So pray uh, for the Eulich family. And just a couple days ago, on Thursday, February 4th, Cynthia Talavera, wife of Pastor Jose Talavera, who oversees the Spanish church that we link arms with who rents here, she passed away suddenly. Um, please pray for Pastor Jose the other leaders in the church, and the church in general, and the school, because she was a big part of both the church and the school, and there are heavy hearts all the way around. So again, I'm going to pray for blessing for those two families. Uh, if there's anything we can do, we'll try and uh, pass it on to you as best we can, but it is a, a time of grieving for many people in our body, and uh, we're told to mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. So let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to uh, really bless in the midst of, of just heartache and grief. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that at the same time, we can sing joys and wonders in the music we've sung and even look in your scriptures and find things that should cause us to awe, but we also grieve and we're also saddened at the passing of Pat Eulich and Cynthia Talavera. I pray that though their faith has become sight, that they have heard, well done, good and faithful servant, that you would comfort those here awaiting to go home to see you. I pray for the Eulich family. I pray for Ashley. I pray for all involved. Bring peace and blessing. May your spirit comfort them. I pray for Pastor Jose and the church and the school and the grief that they feel uh, as Cynthia has passed. Bless and keep them as well. May your spirit comfort them. Help me now just for a few short minutes to unpack your scripture. Don't let me do anything that would be untrue or that would sway people any direction but to the greatness and to the supremacy of your son. Thank you for the gift of music. Thank you for a four-week session to sit back and look at four songs that have impacted the world and our faith. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So our series, Four Giant Songs of the Christian Faith, it's tough to come up with a series featuring only four songs. I know there are many others and many other cultures and many other parts of the world, and in no way is this a complete list, but over the next four Sundays, we just want to take a look and pause and reflect on four songs that have impacted uh, the Christian faith mightily. Um, these songs have impacted my life. I know they've impacted your life and many other Christians' life. And today we're going to look at the song, How Great Thou Art. Let's give a little history of it. You might know it, you might not. So let's see how this song came about. In 1885, Carl Boberg, a Swedish editor and future politician, was walking home in the Bayside town, I'm going to butcher this, I even looked it up, 
of Monsteras, located on Sweden's southeastern coast. A thunderhead appeared on the horizon. Lightning flashed. Thunderclaps shook the air, sending Boberg running for shelter. When the storm began to relent, he rushed home. He opened the windows to let in the fresh bay air, and the vision of tranquility that greeted him stirred something deep in his soul. The sky cleared, thrushes sang, and in the distance, the resonant knell of church bells sounded. With this juxtaposition between roaring thunderstorms and such calm and beauty in his background, Boberg sat down and wrote, O Store Good, the poem that through a winding series of events became the song, How Great Thou Art. After his poem was published in a local newspaper, an unknown Swede put O Store Good to the tune of a Swedish folk song whose name has been lost to history. It just was passed down. In the late 1800s, several versions were published, but it wasn't until the early 1900s that Ostor Good, which translates literally, O oh Mighty God, that's what it translates to, hopped the Swedish border. In the first decade of the 20th century, the song was translated into German. A handful of years later, a Russian version appeared. The first English language song wouldn't be penned until 1925. So the English version was a few decades off still. But this English alliteration, or I'm sorry, this English version translated by the Swedish American E. Gustav Johnson, but it's probably Janssen, right? is a far cry from the song we know today. It took another quarter century. A British missionary and a new translation, added a new translation before the song developed into what we now recognize it to be. Pretty amazing history so far. How did it get to the States? English missionary Stuart K. Hine and his wife heard the Russian version sung as a vocal duet in Ukraine. As the Hind couple crossed into sub-Carpathian Russia, the mountain scenery brought back the memory of the song. The first three standards were composed while in the Carpathian Mountains. When war broke out, Hind and his wife were forced to return to England in 1939. They used the first three standards in an evangelistic endeavor during the blitz years of the war. The fourth stanza was added after the war. Baptist hymnologist William Reynolds cites comments by George Beverly Shea on the hymn's intro or introduction to the United States through the Billy Graham Crusades. We sang it in Toronto, Canada on, at a crusade in 1955, he adds, and his large volunteer choir assisted in the majestic refrains. Soon after we used it in our Hour of Decision radio broadcast and in all American Crusades. In the New York meetings of 1957, the choir joined me singing it 93 times. That's a short history of how this great song got to at least our country. Many of you grew up singing this. This is the version we sing today, at least in our church. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Second stanza, sometimes we don't sing it, but then it says this, when through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Now, there is still some debate how this song got to us, but it got to us. I tried to give you a brief history, but the beautiful part of this song, at least in the first two stanzas, 
is it speaks of God's general revelation to the entire world. To creation. My family and I had a chance to go to the snow, all that snow that fell last weekend up in the mountains. It was kind of a mess because everybody went to the snow. But when we found a little cul-de-sac in a mountain town and got out and just walked down the street, we were at awe of the beauty of nature. Five-foot snowbanks, crystal blue skies, trees covered as white as what? Snow. And it set our hearts back. It removed us from the hustle and bustle and all that we've all been going through. And we were taken aback to look at God's beauty. Again, this is called general revelation. General revelation is the revealing by the divine to all whom he's created outside of, in Christianity, the scriptures or the person of Jesus Christ. It's general, so the whole world can see that creation exists. This notion of general revelation reminds me of Romans chapter 1. Remember upon the reading of the letter to the church in Rome, what had happened. Just a brief history. There was intense persecution and many Hebrew Christians fled the city under Caesar Nero. He was not a good guy at all. Gentile Christians, Christians from, who were proselytized outside the faith, out, outside the Hebrew um, nationality, were forced to lead and run and govern God's church. The persecution had ceased and Hebrew Christians had come back to the church. What could possibly go wrong when a more possibly entitled group of Christians come to a church which they, in many ways they started and they saw it being led and run by people who were Gentiles? Nothing, right? The church was in crisis. And Paul wrote this in chapter 1, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. What truth are they suppressing? Remember that key, that notion I explained about general revelation. Look at verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. How has God shown it to them should be the question. He has revealed it to all people through general revelation. Oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hand have made. I see the stars. I hear the roaring thunder. Rolling thunder. Thy power, here's the key, throughout the universe displayed. So even those who have suppressed the truth are held accountable by God because they should see and know that they didn't evolve solely from alien pawn scum five trillion years ago. That there's a creator. Look at verse 20. This is what we should know in the context of general revelation. For His, God's invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since what, church? The creation of the world in the things that have been made. So, all people, you, me, everybody are what? We are without excuse. We've received general revelation. We've heard the roaring thunder. We've seen God's power in creation throughout the universe. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. The further we get away from being awed at the beauty and the power of creation, the more foolish and darkened our hearts become. So what's the proper response from general revelation? That's how we should read the scriptures and even sing the songs. What is the response at me seeing there's a creator? The proper response 
is always in our faith, humility and repentance. Look at the refrain or the chorus of How Great Thou Art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, How great thou art, how great thou art. This indeed is the proper response. You can see why Billy Graham and his ministry Grab this song. That is the proper response to the good news. It's also the proper response when we've been walking with the Lord for 50 years. How great you are. This is the proper response when we are confronted with the beauty and the wonder of who God is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There should be overwhelming awe and wonder but also proper fear leading to humility, which causes repentance. Let's go to the Gospels. Post-resurrection, many of the disciples have seen the risen Christ, and they are joyful. And there's Thomas, sad, depressed, and doubting. John 20, 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them, the others, when Jesus came. Verse 25 So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into uh, into his side, I will never believe. Careful. Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I love that. Then he turned to Thomas. He said, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. We can't see it here because English is limited. But utter awe, wonder, and joy is put forth in Thomas' response, my Lord and my God. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, hear this church, this verse is for you and for me, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. In Thomas' stubbornness and unbelief and doubt, Jesus, Jesus meets him, Thomas is filled with awe and wonder. That's the proper response when we're put forth with general or this is special revelation. This is revealed to Thomas and the other ten at that point. What about fear, though? Should we fear God? Yes, we should fear Him in a proper way. Another one of the Gospels, Luke 8. You've heard this story, but look at it. One day he got in a boat with his disciples And he said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down the lake. and And they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are dying. We're perishing. It is over. And he woke up. And he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased the wind and waves. And there was what? Calm. He said to them, where's your faith? And they were what? Relieved for a minute, a millisecond. And look at the next scripture. They were afraid. So there's wonder and awe in the next word we see it there, but they were scared. And they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? So the proper response to God's general and specific revelation to our lives is awe and wonder and healthy fear. This should lead to humility and repentance governed by wonder and proper fear. Not the fear the media and politicians on both sides of the aisle have been whipping up for a year now 
but the fear of the Lord. Proper fear, respect, adulation, honor. Isaiah chapter 6 fear. Father, we are a people of unclean lips. Let us close our mouth at times and listen to you. In the third stanza, God, the God of the natural created order, continues to create and act. God sends himself in the form of his son to all of lost humanity. With this stanza in the song, How Great Thou Art, the primary theological perspective shifts from creation and general revelation to atonement for the payment of sin. While the first two stanzas express humanity's awe at the natural created order, this is not the ultimate goal of the song. Human sin, your sin and my sin, has marred the gift of the Creator. The vivid description of nature in the first two stanzas finds its fulfillment in heaven or when we escape earth. And that's the fourth stanza, the third stanza as we sing it. But there is a middle section. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he, Jesus, bled and died to take away my sin. Amen. Hallelujah. This is where the song is going the whole time. This is where we go in our evangelistic prayers and effort. We use what God's created to show people there is a creator, there's a God. But then with all of our might, and it's all God's power and all God's spirit, we want to get here to people when people realize that they've sinned against God and they need the blood of Christ to forgive them, to pay the price. When I think of atonement, there's probably no grander passages than Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. There's a new and better way, the book of Hebrews has said. Paul's writing about that. Although the law and the prophets bear witness or attest to it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. He's piggybacking on what he did in verse chapter 1, remember? You're all the same. It's been revealed to you generally. Jew, Gentile, Hebrew, non-Hebrew, Christian, non-Christian. Creation speaks to the power of God. And now he says, again, there's no distinction. There's no Hebrew and Gentile distinction in the new covenant. Why? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 23. Now 24. And are justified by His grace as a gift. That word in the Greek, it's ongoing grace. We justified once. We've been, our debt has been settled once. Christ did it on the cross. But as we walk with Him, as we live with Him, it's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. That's what it says in the Greek. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 25. Whom Jesus, God put forth as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. Why would God do this? Why did God have to put up for Christians and for the world almost Jesus as a billboard to show to the world, this is who I am. That's what happened on the cross. Why? Verse 25 tells us, whom God put forth as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Old covenant sins. Old Testament sins. The sins of Moses and of Abraham and of Esther.
This is what awaits us all. This is what Pat and Cynthia got a bit of a head start for us. I know things have to come to conclusion, but to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? So Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Verse 4, He, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, verse 6, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the, spring of the water of life without payment. What a story from Genesis to Revelation, what a song we have, how it came down through the ages to us, how great thou art. This is the news to anyone who is in Christ pertaining to their future. No more death, no more mourning, no more pain, no more crying. He will be our God and we will be his people. So church, what is the proper response to that news, to those scriptures? Simply, with humility and repentance, awe, wonder, and proper fear, we proclaim, my God, how great thou art.
to thee. 
sons and daughters We cry Abba Father Jesus has been saved 